Yes. Okay, we're good to go. Thank you. Um, well, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, everyone, for registering. Thank you, Dr. Ron. Um, I'm super excited about this topic. Um, but my name's Brooke. I'm the Director of Outreach for Fusion Academy, Houston Galleria, and Sugarland. We have fusions all over the U.S., so uh, please reach out to me if you want me to connect you to your local person. Um, but we are a one-to-one -one private school, so every single class will be one teacher to one student. We are six through 12th grade and fully accredited. Uh, we offer full-time credit recovery and tutoring and mentoring. Um, we also are open enrollment all year round. So if we have those kiddos that maybe are coming out of treatment or just needing a new school environment, we are able to take them on when they are ready. So yeah, thank you so much. Pam, it's all yours. All righty, good morning, everybody. Nice to see all. All the faces that I can see. My name is Pam Esser, and I'm executive director of the Attention Deficit Disorders Association Southern Region, and we go by ADA SR. Uh, we offer free support groups that are virtual, and then we have workshops. Um, most of those offer CEs, and I will be posting one in the chat because we have one coming up that especially relates uh, two women and, and often those diagnosed later in life. So check us out. Please use us as a resource and a support system. Thank you. Okay. Um, Brooke, I'm going to make you a co-host so you can help admit people as well. Julie, you're up. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Pomerantz and I'm with the Hub Houston. The hub is an acronym for heard, understood, believed in. We have four different programs. One of them is a school. Uh, all of the programs are in Northwest Houston, but the school covers ages 13 to 18 or 19. Um, we also have a young adult program called Life 101, which is a young adult employability day program. Um, at night, we have a young adult social club called Club Hub, which meets three nights a week and one weekend day a month. Finally, we have another young adult program referred to as Aspire Accessories, which is an amazing program in which the young adults are referred to as artisans. They create magnificent items that are sold online and at markets. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you today for all of our programs. I'll just mention um, is for all members on the, uh, you know, neurological differences, autism spectrum, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Hi, I'm Alexandra. I'm a therapist and assistant director at Houston Neuroscience Brain Center. And here we do EEGs where we look for neurobiomarkers that can account for people's symptoms. And then based off their EEG report, we can come up with a treatment plan that can include therapy, um, neurofeedback, photobiomodulation, or referring out to other practitioners. And um, we have a few more weeks left for brain camp, which is intensive neurofeedback training at a discounted rate. And um, today, I'm so excited. We're going to have Kristen Kite. <laughs> She's going to come up in a little bit. Um, she is going to present with Dr. Ron. And so with um, Kristen, she got her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. She is working with us as a neurofeedback technician and working on her neurofeedback um, certificate before she goes back to UT in a year for the social work program, master's program to become a licensed social worker. So we're super excited for her. And I'm super excited to see um, what they're gonna present today. I would just ask if everyone could mute their, um, their account so we don't have any background noise and we will be recording this and we will send out a link um, within like the next day or two. So I'll hand it over to Kristen. We'll do a little shuffling of the seats here, kind of tight in this area, but glad to see everybody. I'm Dr. Ron. Kristen has put this uh, presentation together, and we've got 77 people signed up, according to Brooks. So I'm really happy with that. So, Kristen, uh, let me know what you need us to do. You want to share a screen? Yes, we can share the screen. And I think it's, it's not that. Yeah. 
I believe it's that one. All right. So this presentation is over, oh, down. Okay, ADHD and young women and the disconnect um, on it. So we'll discuss why ADHD symptoms are presented differently in male or in females versus males, um, why females are less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than males, and how hormones affect females with ADHD. Um, so first, I wanted to go and show you all the gender differences in ADHD symptom presentations. So in males, there are more external symptoms. Um, so teachers and parents are more likely to notice these are more hyperactive and impulsive. Um, they have more rule-breaking behaviors. While in females, it's more internal symptoms. So um, this is inattentiveness. They tend to not be as hyperactive. And in general, they have fewer symptoms in the DSM, but they're just as impaired. Um, as they get older, it seems, our research shows that they have more promiscuous behavior and lower self-esteem. Um, but despite these differences in symptom presentation, they have the same symptom severity. Um, so the underdiagnosis of ADHD in females. So historically, ADHD was um, thought of as a male-dominated diagnosis, um, and the prevalence of ADHD in, in adults is less than a twofold higher in men than in women. Um, and like I said earlier, females are just as affected by it. Um, they just have different symptom presentations. Um, females are also less likely to be prescribed meds and tend to be diagnosed at an older age. Um, so why is there this prevalence and uh, difference in prevalence between females and males? So a lot of the time women are not um, diagnosed until later in life because their ADHD is incorrectly attributed to something like anxiety, depression, or a mood disorder. Um, and research shows that ADHD females are less likely to have learning difficulties in school compared to males, so teachers are less likely to notice them struggling with ADHD. Um, and like I said, females have more internal symptoms, so they're more likely to be disregarded. Um, I wanted to briefly go through this. So female hormones and ADHD. So this is cool to see, um, but so the female or the hormone fluctuation in females seems to affect ADHD symptom severity um, because those hormone fluctuations affect the brain. Um, so research has shown that ADHD symptoms change across the menstrual cycle, and estrogen has a big influence on um, ADHD symptom severity. One of the things I want to throw into here is we're doing a, a study right now. We're collecting this data. One of our colleagues um, was an Olympic swimmer, and she was telling me that the coaches know uh, in, when they're coaching female athletes when they should work them harder and when they should not work them as hard, depending on their cycles. And I was thinking, you know, it just makes sense to us that we would should look at women's brains throughout the month and try to figure out how that affects their actual brain, their EEGs, because we if we caught them at a certain time of the month, it may be radically different than another time of the month with nothing else changing. So this is, I think, why I think it does affect the brain and you can have inconsistent, if you have consistent ADHD symptoms, they're more likely to be caught. If they're inconsistent, like in females, which we expect, then they would more likely be just overlooked or uh, because it's not all the time. It's just some of the times and probably at times it's probably worse. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know. Next one. Yeah. So this study, I just wanted to point out one big study on this. So Roberts et al. in 2018 conducted a study to look at the reproductive steroids, which were progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen um, to see how these hormones affected ADHD symptoms across the menstrual cycle, and impulsivity was the moderator. So the results of this study were uh, that ADHD symptoms are higher when estrogen decreases, which is right after ovulation. Um, ADHD symptoms increase during the early follicular and early luteal phases, um, and decreased levels of estrogen in the context of increased levels of progesterone or testosterone were associated with an increase in 
do symptoms on the following day, especially for those with high impulsivity. And this happens right before your period. Um, and this all shows that ADHD symptoms change across the menstrual cycle um, due to hormone changes. And this is a little graph. This is something y'all can look at more in your own time too. Um, but it shows the hormone levels across um, the menstrual cycle. So that dark blue is really interesting because it's estrogen. Um, and we know that when estrogen levels are low, ADHD symptoms seem to be high. So it looks like they're lower in, during the period and right at the end of ovulation, they also dip down. So it's really interesting to see um, like how these, how estrogen really influences ADHD symptom severity. Um, also, there's some scientific evidence that stimulants have a greater effect when they're combined with estrogen, which would make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Um, and I just wanted to go through some treatments for ADHD. So we know there's medications, stimulants, non-stimulants, antidepression or antidepressants, but we know that there's some pretty bad side effects to these. I know for me, um, when I was on stimulants, I was super irritable, didn't have an appetite, I had stomach problems, um, and last one, sleep issues, yep. Um, so neurofeedback is what we do here. It's not invasive. It's a form of operant conditioning, and it can really help with ADHD symptoms. Um, behavioral therapy is great because it reinforces desired behaviors and sets consequences for um, not good behaviors. And talk therapy helps um, people learn new skills to cope with their ADHD symptoms. Um, and I wanted to go into how I manage my ADHD. So I started off on stimulants um, and it didn't work out for me. I, my friends noticed when I was on them just because of my mood. Um, I was always in a low mood. I didn't talk as much, wasn't as bubbly. Yeah. So wasn't great for me. So I decided on my own that I was going to try to do it without medications, um, try to help my ADHD symptoms without medication. So something that's really helped me is time blocking. Um, so I will get a timer when I know I need to get something done, um, and I'll set it for an hour or however long I think I can, um, do that. And then I'll take a break for 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Um, and that just really helps me because I know the break is coming up. Um, so that really helps me and it splits my tasks up into chunks. Also a distraction free environment is huge for me. I cannot do work. At my house, I have to go to a library or during school, I had to go to a library or a coffee shop um, because I just couldn't do it at home. I would get too distracted. Distracted. Also, deleting apps that, um, you know, distract you um, is really huge for me. Um, and turning your phone on silent mode or do not disturb is huge. Um, and finding your passion. ADHD um, people become hyper-focused usually on one thing. and um, I think that's really interesting and I, you know, it's great for people with ADHD and we become obviously easily bored and distracted. So it's good to find what you're passionate about. So how old were you when you were diagnosed? Middle school. Middle school? Yeah. How was it caught? How, how did you get attention to your ADD in middle school? And a lot of girls don't. So I started off with dyslexia. That was my first thing and anxiety. So like I said before, a lot of, I think it was anxiety first. I had testing anxiety pretty bad in um, elementary school and like I was physically shaking during <laughs> tests. Um, so that was probably the first one. And then my mom decided to get me tested for dyslexia. And then in middle school, I finally was like, there's something I can't, I couldn't focus. There was something else and it was ADHD. I had very, very mild dyslexia too. And I think honestly, I've gotten over that. So it was more ADHD than dyslexia. For, for me, for sure. Did they test and find it in the testing when they tested you for dyslexia? No, it wasn't until later. The test that I did was only for dyslexia. Okay. Sure okay. So how did they find the ADHD? Um, I had to go to another test. Okay. So eventually. Eventually, yeah. Okay. So. 
Yep. Interesting how that gets split up. Yeah, it is really interesting. <clears throat> um, Self-care is huge too. I know that I work better when I get exercise done in the morning and I'm focused the rest of the day. Um, a good diet, omega-3s obviously help with brain function, good quality sleep. Um, I love short meditations or prayers. Help me. Um, and then talk therapy. So managing emotions can be hard for ADHD people, especially because there's a lot of comorbid diagnoses with ADHD. So it's helpful to talk to a therapist when that's needed. Um, and learn your body. Like I talked about um, earlier with the hormones, finding out when you work best during um, or when you operate best during the month is huge. Um, and do the most important tasks in your most energetic part of the day. So mine's after I get that workout done. So middle afternoon, that's when I get my best work done. And that's huge for me. That's interesting though about the hormones, mm -hmm. uh, especially in young females that are on uh, birth control and things like this. I know there's some hormones that really affect women very negatively and yeah. could affect that. Have you ever experienced anything like that? I have, I recently, actually this year just got off birth control and I have found that I'm more clear. I've also been doing neurofeedback and that's really helped me too, but um, I didn't respond well to birth control and I was on low estrogen. Um, so yeah, that could definitely affect. There's a lot of moving parts to this. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to briefly go through some supplements for ADHD we know. Omega-3 um, has been shown to help with ADHD symptoms because it enhances focus and memory. Um, vitamin D, ADHD children are more likely to have a vitamin D deficiency. Um, zinc, it's been shown in a research study that it helps lessen the dose of ADHD medicine. Um, magnesium helps with emotional regulation. Iron, important for brain function. And melatonin, really helped me too when I was younger, but I kind of weaned off um, and it helps with sleep, but always five milligrams or less. And some of the, one of the recent studies that we're working on and we're trying to develop a, uh, a set of um, uh, a table that will help identify abnormal labs and how they could contribute to ADHD symptoms. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that I think this is an under um, appreciated uh, part of a, a normal workup when you go to your doctors is that they do lab reports, but the doctors really don't um, understand the psychological presentation of abnormal labs. And that's what we've been looking into. And it's amazing how many labs that, uh, how many abnormalities in labs can produce uh, anxiety, can produce ADHD symptoms, and can produce um, uh, psychosis even, which is really quite interesting. And I guarantee you, the treatment for ADHD that we have in psychiatry won't treat abnormal labs like this. So I think that's where the supplements are likely coming in. I know iron is really, really important. And one of the things that can really, for women with high flows, this can be something that should be watched quite closely because if you're anemic, it's going to be difficult to function. I went through an experience like that before one of my surgeries where I'd lost like half my blood volume. And let me tell you, it's hard to focus at that time. So, you know, I think this is very important, maybe why the supplements work, but it would be nice to take a good look at your labs uh, when you do normal blood work and see if there's something there you could do that instead of just arbitrarily putting on these, which we know almost everybody's low on vitamin D, especially after COVID uh, and the omega-3s, you can always count on those to help you. Uh, a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of these um, supplements um, they are excreted through urine if you don't, you know, whatever's excess. So that that is good, but the omegas are more oil-based. So you kind of got to watch those. But even mega doses are used for a lot of things like brain injury. Um, and how to advocate for those with ADHD. Um, so educate yourself on what it's like to have ADHD. I think that's really big. Be empathetic. Um, I know my mom used to be like, you forgot to do this again. And that doesn't make anyone feel better. You know, um, also this was big for me when I was a kid too, to try to connect a purpose with the activity that's needing to get done. That's really, really big for most ADHD. So yeah, like we think, um, 
if I know my room needs to be clean, try to connect a purpose with that. Like maybe, you yeah, you have visitors coming or I don't know. Yeah. Visitors coming. Um, so just try to connect some sort of little purpose with little tasks that a lot of ADHD people have problems with. Um, have patience, listen to them and try to validate their emotions um, and share their wins, mm -hmm. show your appreciation. Um, and when they do something great, it's good to show appreciation so they can reinforce that. Oh. And the takeaways were that Females are less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD due to their symptom presentation. Um, for female hormones do have an impact on ADHD symptom severity. Um, and there are other resources and treatments for ADHD besides medicine. So, yeah. All right. Well, okay. so let me stop the share and let's talk about this for a little bit. Yeah. Perfect timing. We've got a little over 30 minutes. So any questions out there from anybody? You'd have to unmute yourself first, I'm sure. There's three. Yeah. There's three? Okay, let's see what they have to say. Oh, Ruth is raising her hand. Yes, Ruth, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for addressing this topic. I work with uh, college students, graduate students, PhD students, and professionals who carry a diagnosis of ADHD. And what you're describing... Um, is exactly what I see. Uh, and the, the, the suggestions are very effective. The uh, finding a purpose for cleaning your room uh, and, then, and finding that motivation.